Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to another Timescale technical session. I'm your host, Avtar Sirathan. I'm a developer advocate here at Timescale. And today we're going to be talking about Postgres insert performance. We're going to dive into improving Postgres insert performance and leave you with five actionable ways that you can actually implement to improve your insert performance today. Now, one thing about Team Timescale is that we really love Postgres so much so that we extended it for scale and time series data and both timescale DB on top of it. So in today's session, I'm gonna share with you some tips from the timescale team on things that we found to work in practice, as well as things that we've heard from timescale users in order to help you improve your ingest performance. Uh, before we get into the content of today's session, first up some housekeeping. So this is an interactive session. So please ask questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom at any time. So you'll see there's a couple of buttons at the bottom of your screen. Uh, one of them is a Q&A, one of them is a chat. If you just wanna post general comments, you can do that in the chat. Uh, but if you wanna ask a question about the content that we're covering or questions that you may have that, about something that you want us to get into that we haven't, uh, please use the Q&A feature. And myself and a member of the Timescale technical team um, who is a super experienced in Postgres, Timescale engineer David Cohn is here to help us. Uh, so please uh, ask questions during the session. This is the time to actually get that kind of live interaction. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone that you will receive a recording of today's session with uh, the slide deck and links to the resources that I'm gonna mention. So you can rewatch it or share it with your teammates as you wish. Okay, so uh, we all uh, know the topic for today is improving Postgres insert performance. Before I get into the content, just want to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, since we're going to be spending the next 30 to 40 minutes together. Uh, so my name is Aftar. I am from South Africa. I'm super interested in how to use technology to empower people. And that's why I really like my job as a developer advocate here at Timescale. Uh, part of being a developer advocate is learning about new technologies and, and new problems all the time. And I document the stuff that I learn on Twitter and on my personal website. So the, the links are there and, and the URLs are there if you wanna follow along, if you'd like. Uh, but in terms of the, the real content for today, let's get into the roadmap and, and give you a preview of what you can expect from today's session. So firstly, we're gonna talk about ingest and time series data. I just wanna give you some motivation for the tips that you're gonna see. You know, Why is ingest important when you're dealing with time series use cases. Some of you may know this, but to some other people it might be new. So I wanted to cover it just that we're all on the same page. Then we're gonna get into demos. We're gonna look at five ways to improve your Postgres insert performance. I'll be talking about batch inserts, parallel inserts, using performant disks and using separate disks for your write ahead log and your data. And I'll be demoing a DevOps data set in order to show the impact of these different factors on your insert rate. And I'll also be sharing tools and libraries and other resources that might be useful for you to explore further. So you can look out for those with this uh, wrench or tool emoji. So wherever you see that, that's gonna be a tool that you can explore uh, further. Uh, then I'll go into uh, uh, telling you about Timescale DB as the fifth tip and, and look into one timescale specific tip uh, to improve your ingest performance, which is gonna be about uh, writing data in loose time order. And then lastly, we'll do a quick recap and then we'll get into answering your questions. So once again, you know, please ask questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, screen. Okay, so now that we know where we're gonna go today, let's take the first step and go into the first topic of ingest and time series data. So again, you know, I just wanted to talk about the importance of ingest rate for time series workloads. Some of you may be familiar with this, so this may be revision, for others, it may be new. Okay. So why is ingest rate important for time series data scenarios? So before we get into that question, by way of definitions, your insert rate is just how fast you can insert new data into your database. It's also called an ingest rate because uh, data is being ingested um, into, the, into the database. I'll be using these two terms interchangeably today. Now your insert performance is critical for many different kinds of Postgres use cases. Uh, and this includes many time series scenarios. So things like DevOps, IoT, application monitoring, application analytics, and, and, and many more cases. 
Now, the unique thing about time series scenarios is that they really insert heavy workloads. And what that means is that, you know, when you're um, monitoring something or when you're analyzing something, uh, new observations for the system are new rows being inserted. They're not overrides or updates to existing rows. And so because you're inserting new rows all the time with each observation, optimizing the speed at which your data can actually ingest this new data becomes really, really essential. Uh, and the other thing is that scale. So, you know, when you're dealing with this large amounts of data and, and new data coming in all the time, and depending on um, this, the scale of your, your system, you want to uh, be able to perform at a large scale. And so today uh, I'll be chatting to you about this, this S word scale and giving you tips to help you deal with the large amounts of data being inserted into the database. Okay, so that's some motivation for what we're gonna see and, and some of the um, background to, to why improving your ingest performance is important uh, in, in time series use cases. Let's get into the demo, which is gonna be about five tips to improve your Postgres ingest performance. Now, the five tips that I'm gonna chat to you about today actually come from this a uh, blog post that we put out a few weeks ago uh, that talked about 13 ways that you can improve your Postgres insert performance. So this is a blog live on the Timescale blog. I'll actually link to it later on in the session. But basically this gives a more comprehensive guide to uh, different ways and different factors that you can play around with to optimize your ingest rate and, and meet the specific requirements of your use case. And I've just picked the five most useful things that I think will be most applicable to everyone. And, um, that the, the timescale team think will be generally applicable to demo today. And again, I'll post a link to this blog post at the end of the presentation that you can, uh, you can go and read up the extra eight tips. Uh, and I'm only going to demo five for you today. Um, okay. So that's where this, uh, the content that I'm going to be talking about comes from today. And um, in terms of, you know, instead of just telling you about these things, I wanted to demo the effectiveness of some of these tips to give you a feel for how much you can actually improve your ingest performance uh, using like a sample data set. So what I've done is uh, I've got together this DevOps uh, scenario, DevOps or IT monitoring. Uh, it's a classic time series data scenario. And uh, the demo data set that I'm gonna be using is I've got 4,000 devices and they each are generating 10 CPU metrics every 10 seconds for 24 hours. So it's a classic uh, scenario you have you know, your devices emitting metrics every so often. And the data set size is not uh, huge compared to obviously like production workloads, but it's large enough such that we can actually uh, have a lot of data to play around with. Uh, it's around 345 million metrics and 34 and a half million rows. So uh, not a tiny data set such that, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to actually improve the ingest performance of uh, inserting this data with the different factors that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, and the way that I have uh, constructed this data set is using something called the time series benchmarking suite. So this is uh, something I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about, but it's basically an open source tool that allows you to benchmark the insert and query performance of databases for time series workloads specifically. So um, you can check it out on GitHub. It's completely open source. Uh, it uh, allows you to compare the performance of different databases like Timescale and, and Postgres, as well as um, non-SQL uh, databases as well. But I'm gonna be using it to test out Postgres today. Okay, and then in terms of my uh, machine specs, and this is um, important since we're gonna be chatting about, you know, how you can actually make the most use of your machine resources. So today I'm just running uh, this Postgres instance on a digital ocean droplet. We've got uh, 192 gigs of RAM, 32 CPUs, and uh, uh, 4.8 terabytes of disk. And I'm running on Postgres 12.3 inside a Docker container. So that's just the uh, background for the demo that we're gonna see. Um, and we're gonna be chatting about you know, how uh, the different factors that I've just talked about, how we can actually, um, how they impact inside performance and how sometimes you might not be making the most use of the resources that you have. Okay, so, um, in terms of like how we're gonna show this, I just wanna uh, give you guys a um, overview of how I actually put together some of the graphs that you're gonna see. So I'm gonna I'm using something again called the time the time series benchmarking suite, and uh, what this allows you to do is when you load data in, well that's quite a lot. Uh, so uh, when you load data in, I'm gonna be using this load command, 
and it has a bunch of flags that I'm going to be playing around with. There's three ones that I want to show you in particular. So the first one is going to be about the batch size. This is going to be the first thing that I'm going to talk about, which is how many um, rows are you going to be inserting at a time? So I'm going to be playing around with this and showing you the impact of, of uh, how big a batch size and your ingest performance. The second one that I'm going to talk about is going to be the number of workers, which is at the bottom here. And this is just basically how many parallel clients you have inserting data into the database at the same time. Um, and that's going to be tip number two, which is going to be about parallel inserts. And the third one is this parameter here, which uh, for those of you who are uh, timescale users uh, will be familiar with this. And that's uh, the use hypertable parameter. So basically, um, if uh, I set this to off, I'll just be testing on uh, regular Postgres. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be doing for the first four tips uh, because I'm just going to focus on Postgres. We're not going to be using timescale at all for the first uh, few, uh, for the, like the first four parts of, of this session. Okay, so that's uh, some orientation for some of the flags that you're going to see that I'm going to be typing into the, the terminal. Um, there's many other parameters you can fiddle with as well if you want to test it out. Um, but we'll see an example of, of how this comes into play in a moment. Okay, but let's get back to the first tip, which is going to be about, as I mentioned, uh, using batch inserts. Okay, and the, the key takeaway here is that in order to achieve higher insert rates, you should insert your data with many rows in each insert call, uh, rather than inserting it at like one row at a time. Uh, this is uh, according to um, uh, timescale engineers who worked with customers and, and who worked with uh, users, it's the best bang for your buck tip. This is something that a lot of people get wrong. They, they don't know that um, they're actually inserting single rows of data at, the time, at a time. And so an easy way to fix this is to try to insert hundreds or thousands of rows per insert. And you can do this by using some sort of bulk insert command or uh, some sort of uh, batch insert um, in, in your library as well. And we'll be talking a little bit about what one or two of those things might be in a second. Now, uh, for those of you just wondering, you know, inserting multiple rows in one call is just called a batch insert. And the size of the batch is the number of rows that you insert at a time. And I'll be taking a look in a moment about how this batch size uh, actually affects your insert performance. Uh, and the reason why this works is that when you insert multiple rows at one time, it allows the database to spend less time on things like connection management and transaction overhead and SQL parsing and more time on processing the data. Because every time you do an insert, you have this fixed overhead that is being incurred. So instead of paying that overhead uh, multiple times when you're inserting uh, a single row at a time, we'd rather just pay it once or as, as um, infrequently as possible and insert as much data as we can. So that's kind of like an uh, intuition for why this uh, is a good idea. Uh, and I'll be chatting to you about some tools that you can use uh, in order to get batch inserts to work. Uh, some of them, uh, obviously, depending on the, the client side driver that you're using, uh, there's many different things out there, but I'll be just showing you uh, PG copy and this execute values method uh, for when you're using Python. Okay, uh, now let's get a sense for how batching actually is um, affecting your insert rate. And uh, essentially, so we just got this question about how many columns are considered batch insert or bulk insert. So I'm going to show you, you know, what, what the actual, you know, depending on um, how many, how many uh, uh, rows you want to insert at one time. Let's just start with a, a simple example of just inserting one row at a time using the sample data set that I, that I talked about earlier. When we insert one row at a time, we get about 8,000 rows per second uh, being inserted. And uh, when we increase that to 100 rows at a time, or a batch size of 100, we get uh, an insert rate of 183,000 uh, or so rows per second. So that's something like a 23x improvement. Now, this goes to show you that you just get a, a basically like an instant increase in your um, insert performance just by batching it uh, into uh, using more than one row at a time. That'll, that'll give you a huge boost uh, in, the, in the beginning. And then you can also see that, you know, as we increase this batch size, so the question is, you know, we went from one, one to 100, 
uh, what happens if we increase the batch size? So what I did is I ran it with a batch size of 1000 and we actually further improved the ingest performance this time from uh, 183,000 rows to around 260,000 rows. So almost a two X increase in your ingest rate. Now the question again arises, you know, what if we keep increasing the batch size, uh, at what point does this, this trick stop working? And so what we're going to do now is just, uh, run it with a batch size of 10,000 and find out what, uh, what that limit actually is for this particular data set. So let's uh, exit out of the presentation again and switch over to my terminal where I've just uh, pasted in a command to run uh, this particular data set, uh, 4,000 devices, each generating uh, 10 metrics over one day. That's the, the name of the data set. And you can see here, the most important thing to pay attention to is this batch size, which is 10,000. So uh, let me run this. And then uh, we can see data is being inserted. Uh, unfortunately, it takes about like three or four minutes to insert or two or three minutes, depending on how fast it is. I don't want to just sit here waiting. So what I've done is I actually uh, pre-ran this. Uh, so you can see the batch size is 10,000 here. All the other params are the same. And uh, this is the result that I've got. So just to show you, you know, this is the, the data actually being inserted into the database. These are statistics that I'm getting. But I pre-ran this and I got a result of about 283,000 uh, rows per second. Uh, and if you times that by 10, that's the number of metrics per second. Um, and that's just about similar to what I got when I ran it uh, a couple of days ago, which if we move back to the presentation, is, oh, in this case, I got 258,000. So, in, you know, you, you might get a slight increase. But the takeaway here is that the increase in ingest performance from going from 1,000 rows in your batch to 10,000 rows is uh, fairly uh, minimal. You know, you might get a slight increase as I got there, or you might just get the same or even slightly worse. And so what that tells you is that, you know, you need to tinker around a little bit to find the optimal batch size um, and you are going to experience diminishing returns at some point. And so you need to test it and find for your specific workload, what number that is. Uh, and I found for this data set, it's somewhere between 1000 and 10,000 for this, this toy data set that I'm playing around with. Uh, and so the takeaway is, you know, if you're loading data at once, use large, large batches. If you have a lot of data coming into your database at once, use large batches when you're inserting. Okay. So now that, uh, we've, I'm more convinced about the, the value of this uh, particular tip. Let's take a look at how you can actually implement it in your code. So the first one uh, is going to be about uh, Python. So I'm just going to uh, feature a couple of tools for Python. And this one is called PG copy. So this is a, um, a uh, library that you can install uh, in order to insert data into your Postgres database really fast using Python. And there's a tutorial that we put together on how you can actually use it. Um, if you uh, visit this link at the bottom of the slide, or you can go to tsdb.co forward slash Python dash how dash two to check out this Python tutorial. So that's one option. But another option that uh, timescale engineers actually like is just in the uh, Python driver psycho PG2 is this method called execute values. Now what this does is that it allows you to uh, batch insert um, things into your into your database, but you don't have to worry about how you deal with things like on conflict clauses. So it, it makes the, the management of, of things a little bit easier. So that's something to check out. I've put a link to the specific docs at the end uh, of this slide. Uh, so once you get this presentation, you can check out the link and uh, start using this. And of course, you know, I've just shown you two examples in Python. I could be a uh, for uh, hours telling you about the different drivers in different languages. Obviously there's functions, uh, methods in, in PGX for Go uh, and in uh, JDBC or, or Hibernate for Java. Basically you wanna find these functions that give you the batch insert option in the client side driver and in the language of your choice. Uh, so that's something that you can, you can look out for and find the thing that works for you. Okay, so now we've got uh, through the first tip. So we've talked about the power of uh, batch inserts. And now we're going to talk about the second tip about parallel writes. Before I get into that, I see we've had five questions so far. That's uh, really great. Um, 
And there's one clarification that I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, David, to chat about before I go in, get into the second tip. Uh, David, sure. Just, I just wanted to, to offer one quick thing on, on the Psycho PG2. If you go back one slide, Athar. Um, go ahead. Uh, the, so just so you know, it's very confusing. There is another, um, uh, there's another command in Psycho PG2 called execute batch. That's not the one you want. Um, and even though we're talking about batch inserts and it seems like that should be the one, um, that is not the correct one, just so you know, that's all. Oh, that's a very good point. I actually, sh I actually should have mentioned that. Yeah. The one that you're looking for is this one that I put on the screen, execute underscore values. Uh, that's the one that actually does batch inserts, as David just mentioned. So that'll save you from some confusion. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for everyone for putting in uh, your questions. That's, uh, we've had about five questions so far. We've been answering them as you go. So if you want to get your questions answered, please put them in. Uh, next, we're going to chat about parallel writes. And the key here is you want to execute multiple insert commands in parallel. Now, the reason why this works is because Postgres can't parallelize data modifying operations for you, can parallelize some reads. So if you want parallelism, you're gonna to have to do it with client side code. And uh, the other reason why this works is that each insert or copy command to Postgres is executed as a single transaction and thus runs in a single threaded fashion by default, unless you, um, you change that. And so to achieve higher ingest rates, you should execute multiple inserts or copy commands in parallel. Um, and so that's a kind of an intuition for why it works. And a pro tip here is that, you know, often um, you want to be aware of the constraints that you have in terms of your CPU resources. So you want to make sure that you have sufficient number of cores for multiple workers. So uh, one of the tips that uh, the timescale team uses is uh, you don't, once you start to get into uh, 1.5 to two times the number of cores uh, on your machine, that's like the number of workers. So say I have a eight core machine. Once I start getting into 12 to 16 workers, this is going to be, uh, you're going to start seeing diminishing returns in that case. So you're going to start see things plateauing. Uh, okay. So the main thing is here, you know, just make sure you have enough cores for the number of workers that you're running. Uh, so running 32 uh, workers on a two CPU machine, not going to be super helpful. Um, you know, it's, 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 you're going to, you're going to see uh, not that, not that much of an increase than running like two workers or four workers. Okay. Now uh, that's the, the pro tip. And then uh, another thing that I'm going to show you is this tool for loading large CSV files uh, that actually allows you to, uh, that, that loads it in, um, that, that allows you to use the PG copy command and, and, takes it and makes it parallel. Um, and that's something that we're going to see in the next slide called timescale DB parallel copy. Uh, unfortunately, the text is a bit blurrier than I, than I initially thought. But basically what this does is uh, it's, a, it's a program for allowing you to execute Postgres's built-in copy functionality for inserting data into Postgres or into timescale DB. So this is something you can check out. The GitHub link is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so you can investigate that. This works particularly well on uh, CSV files. So if you have large CSV files that you want to insert, uh, this is something that you can check out. Okay. Now uh, let's look at the effect of parallel writes on insert performance. So the the key here is, you know, again the the, the example of just having one worker having a, right, everything running in a single threaded fashion, we get about sixty four thousand rows per second. But once we, re, uh, once we increase that to eight workers, we actually see an increase to 273,000 rows per second for this particular configuration that I'm testing. That's uh, about a 4x increase between one and eight workers. Now, uh, the key here is, again, you can see an instant improvement uh, in the um, ingest rate. And uh, so this is a, a great argument for why you should explore how to um, do things in, in parallel and, and running parallel clients. Now, uh, we noticed earlier that I had a 32 core machine. So let's see what the result is that I'm gonna get with 32 workers. Um, actually going back, so what I did, okay, let me actually run this again. So once again, let us 
insert this into the database. So uh, again, the key here is the, the number of workers that I have here is 32. I'm actually still using the 10,000 batch size. So, uh, but I ran it again just to see what number we'd get. And in this case, we've got uh, 287,000 or so rows per second. Uh, and that is, uh, that is just about the number that I had when I ran it earlier this week. This time it was 298. So give or take uh, 10,000 rows or so, uh, depending on, um, just depending on the time that you're running it. Uh, and you can see here that like the increase from eight workers to 32 workers only gives us about like 20,000 20, rows per second more. And that's kind of odd because you'd expect uh, when you're utilizing all of your CPU, that's the thing that um, that's going to give you a, a much higher increase than just using like one fourth of it. So you can see here that like, again, in my case, given the, the, other, the other configurations that I have, this is the point that at where I'm starting to see diminishing returns. And as I mentioned, the, the rule of thumb is that you should really only start to see uh, CPU saturation at around 1.5 to two times the amount of workers that uh, the amount of cores that you're running. And so over here, I probably haven't hit that yet. I'm running on a 32 core machine. So I'm, I'm, I need to explore and see, you know, what are the other things that I can do to try and improve it. Uh, and here, you know, again, the lesson is that we've hit limitations on uh, IO saturation most probably. The, the, the problem is probably in the, the latency and the input and the output from the database versus the actual uh, CPU power that's, that's running. So this is a key example of how, you know, you'd expect this number to be a lot bigger, but because of other considerations, we're not making the most of it. So we can fix those other considerations, then we can actually better utilize the CPUs that we have. Okay, um, so that is the second tip about parallel inserts. Uh, just a reminder for everyone that's been answering questions. Again, we've had eight questions asked and answered. Thank you uh, for everyone who's been uh, putting in the questions and, and receiving answers. So um, that is it for the, the second uh, tip. We're going to get into the third tip, which is about using performant disks. Again, if you have any questions about this or the batching and the parallel writes, ask them and they'll be answered in the, the Q&A uh, feature. Okay, so we're zooming along quite nicely. Uh, tip number three is about using performant disks. So you saw that how, you know, the issue that I had earlier is that I'm not fully utilizing my CPU that I have. The problem is probably in something in, um, with regards to my input and output. And a, a candidate might be the fact that the disks that I'm using might be slow. And uh, again, slow disks really impact your inside performance due to the disk latency that comes uh, from your IO operations. And so there's a couple of reasons why this might be the case. The first one is just the deployment environment that I'm, that I'm uh, deploying it in. Now, some people might be deploying the database in environments that have slow disks, whether it's due to the uh, hard disk drive option that you selected in the cloud provider of your choice, or you're running it in a remote uh, SAN, uh, which is a storage area network. There's many things that may come in, in into play. So that might be one reason. The other reason is because of how Postgres functions, where when you're inserting rows, the data is durably stored to the right ahead log first before the transaction completes. And uh, therefore slow disks here can actually impact your insert performance quite a bit. And so one tool that I wanna show you is called IO ping. It uh, comes uh, standard with um, Linux, uh, any, any Linux machine. Uh, you can use this to check the disk IOPS and see if your disk speed is actually the thing that's causing your bottleneck. Uh, and let me just show you uh, how this tool works. Uh, going back to my terminal, all my messy screenshots on the, on the desktop. Okay, so we're in the terminal and let me just show you a little bit about IOPing. Okay. So you can see IOPing, it's this tool that allows you to monitor IO latency in real time. And it shows you the disk latency in the same way as a ping command would show you the network latency. And there's many different uh, flags that you can play around with. You can configure the number of requests that you wanna test. You can configure things like the request size uh, and uh, other things like your speed limit and things like that. I'm just gonna run a simple test over here. So let me just clear this up. Uh, I'm gonna run a simple test where we're gonna have uh, 10 
as the number of requests that we're running. So the first test I'm gonna run is a read test. So it's testing how fast I can actually read from the database. So I'm gonna do 10 requests here and each request side is just gonna be eight kilobytes and I wanna test it in the current um, working directory that I'm in right now. Okay, and you can see here the, the tests are being run, the each request is coming in and I can actually see the time that everything is being run in. And uh, at the end, we get the summary of statistics and it's quite a lot of numbers here, but the thing that you wanna look at is gonna be the number of IOPS in this case. So for your read test, which is what we did right now, we're looking for numbers in the thousands of IOPS. In this case, I've got uh, 2.68 thousand IOPS over here. And uh, again, if you're not seeing uh, numbers in the thousands, uh, it's probably your disk that's slowing things down. And obviously, if you, if you want things to run even faster, you can use faster disks and, and this number should be, uh, should be uh, more, it, it should be higher than, than what it is right now. Okay, so that's the, the right, that's the read test. That's how fast the data is being read by the disk. Now let's use a write test example. So again, I'm gonna use the IOPIN command. And in this case, 10 uh, requests again. And the size of those requests are gonna be eight kilobytes. And in this case, I wanna use the write flag and testing on the, on the current directory. Okay. So we're seeing uh, this warm up. So uh, this is actually testing how fast uh, I can write to the disk that I have. You can see, okay, one of them is a bit slow. One of them is a bit slow. And in this case, uh, the number, once again, you get a nice summary of the statistics uh, of what happened during that test. The number that you care about is uh, this one again in the first row, uh, the number of IOPS and here, the number needs to be in the range of hundreds. So in this case, I've got 402, which is, which is a good number. But if you're seeing less than, than hundreds of IOPS, then your disk hardware might be the problem. And there's things that you can do to fix this. Of course, you can look at and see if alternate storage configurations are feasible. You can try and upgrade your disks. I know in, in most cloud providers, they have the option to change the kind of disks that you use to more performant disks, for example, if you're using uh, Timescale Cloud, you can use like the input output optimized um, configuration. So you wanna look out for things like that, obviously depending on, on what you're doing, the, the options are gonna be different, but that's the kind of thing that you'd look for uh, in that uh, cloud context. Okay, so we just saw uh, that we probably should use performance disk. Uh, we saw a way about using IOPing in order to check if disk speed is a bottleneck. Let's get into tip number four, which is about using separate disks for your write ahead log and your data. Okay, now uh, the, the key here is you wanna split up your workloads. Uh, you wanna split up the write ahead log and the data into two workloads. And uh, this is because we know that the data gets first written to the write ahead log and then gets written to the disk. So to speed it up, we can actually separate the load and use separate disks. Now this takes a little bit of configuration um, but it's actually worth it if you need very high ingest rates or you're dealing with things like network attached, uh, network attached storage. Uh, so that's uh, a couple of uh, use cases this might be useful for. Um, it might not be applicable to everyone's situation, but if you're really looking for the high end of uh, inside performance, this is something you should definitely look at. And there's a number of resources on how to actually make this happen. Uh, there's one that I found from Postgres professionals uh, that I've linked at the bottom here, and that can actually give you something to get started if you want to try and implement this on your own. Okay, so that's um, the, the two disk-related tips that we have. Again, thank you for the questions so far. We have um, nine questions in total. So thank you, everyone who's been asking questions. Hit the Q&A button if you have questions about anything that I've talked about. And uh, if I don't answer them during the session, we can talk about them at the end. Okay, and now it's time for the, the, the fifth and final tip uh, that I'm gonna talk about, and that's using Timescale DB. So some of you might already be familiar with Timescale DB, uh, while others, this might be the first time that you're actually finding out about it. If so, you know, welcome to the Timescale community, it's great to have you. But as I mentioned earlier, Timescale uh, as a company, we really love Postgres. We've built Timescale DB on top of Postgres. Um, and that's because we know that you know, Postgres is great for a lot of things, but it's not 
ideal as it is for time series workloads, which are the, the workloads that I've been talking about today. And so what we've done is built Timescale DB, which is essentially uh, as many customers and many just Timescale users like to describe it, Postgres for time series. And what this does is that it makes Postgres more scalable and improves its ingest performance for time series workloads. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the reason why this is important here is because in these time series use cases, they're very time centric, they're very insert heavy, they're, they're very much like append only, there's um, a lot of inserts, and they also require fast ingest of large amounts of data in like very small time windows. Uh, and so that's a couple of things that timescale is optimized for. So the first one is consistently high ingest. I'll chat a little bit about what I mean by the word consistently high in a second. It also does really well with high cardinality data and then offers fast complex queries um, with things like full SQL and, and built-in time series functions. So that's kind of on the analysis side. Uh, on the ingest side, the main uh, thing to keep in mind is that it just offers you high performance at scale. Uh, and it's kind of the thing where, you know, once you configure it, you don't really have to worry about coming back to it. Um, whereas, you know, with, with things like Postgres, in the beginning, it might be working a certain way and then after one month or three months, you need to come back and you realize, okay, things have slowed down. I need to, I need to sort it out again. Uh, and then the other thing for, for those who are new to timescale, uh, the great thing about it is that it's packaged as a Postgres extension. So if you already use Postgres, timescale is quite literally a natural extension to Postgres. Uh, and so you don't need to install a whole new database or anything like that. It's just an extension on top of Postgres. If you're already using Postgres, uh, you'll pretty much know uh, how to use um, uh, time scale, you have a better feeling of how to use time scale. Okay, so that's a little bit about like the background for using time scale. Let's take a look at how it compares to Postgres. Um, and I'm going to look at the ingest performance of time scale versus Postgres. So uh, the, 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 the key thing here to notice is, as I mentioned, time scale gives you this consistently high ingest rate as the size of your data grows. Um, as, as you get into things like billions of, of rows, um, whereas Postgres uh, decays after some period of time. Now, a couple of things to mention about this, this data, and I'll be very transparent about it. The first one is that this graph is actually from a, a old uh, study that we did in, in 2017. So it was like Postgres 9.6 and one of the early versions of Timescale. Both Timescale and Postgres have improved significantly since then. We're now in Postgres 12 and uh, coming up on, on timescale 2.0. And so while the specific numbers have changed and Postgres insert performance has uh, actually improved quite a lot in, um, in the early uh, stages as, as the data set grows, the story that we continue to hear from people remains the same. And that is that Postgres is great at the start. It's a great starting point, but after one month or three months, it stagnates quite a lot. Whereas with timescale, you know, you, you get that consistently good performance even as your data starts uh, to scale quite a bit in, uh, in production. And so we're currently in the process of redoing this benchmark, which is the best graph I could find at, at this stage. Um, and that gives you an intuition for sort of why timescale is really good at um, handling these kinds of high ingest rates uh, over long uh, periods of time, which makes it great for things like production workloads. Okay, and then uh, for those of you who are already using uh, timescale, uh, if you're not, you know, definitely it's something to consider if you want faster ingest performance. But if you're already using timescale, uh, there's some uh, a bonus tip that I wanted to tell you, which is about writing data in loose time order. And uh, this is something that actually takes advantage of the way that timescale works. So when you write your data in, uh, the recommendation here again is to, to load your data in sorted increasing time order. And the reason why that works is that when you have new rows inserted into timescale DB, uh, the new data is often going to be stored into chunks in memory. So these chunks you can think of uh, as like their, their own table. Uh, and this, this is gonna be uh, stored in, in chunks that are large enough to put in memory. Whereas if you're loading data in uh, a different order than like increasing in time, if you're loading data by say like server or by location or some, some other key, when you encounter an old time scam, that's going to slow things down because you're going to have to read from your disk. And so what uh, the recommendation is, again, you know, load your data in sorted increasing time order. And if you're bulk loading data, you want to make sure that you're inserting things by time 
versus by server. So for example, if I'm bulk loading data for the past 30 days, I want to insert day number one, day number two, day number three versus uh, data from server one, server two, server three that uh, causes me to go through that 30 days each time I am inserting uh, uh, data for a specific, specific server. So you can find more information on this in the, in the blog post, but I just want to mention it just in case you already use timescale and you're looking for ways to improve it. The other good thing I wanted to mention is that because timescale is built on Postgres, all the four tips that I talked about earlier about things like batching and parallel inserts and stuff like that, they still apply. You can still actually play around with them. And this is just some graphs to show you that, hey, you know, if you uh, use batching on timescale DB, you'll get, you'll get uh, improved performance. Uh, this is for this data set that I have right here. And then again, if you use parallel writes, uh, you get improved performance. Um, you know, once again, the same as, as if you're uh, doing uh, Postgres. Okay, and uh, the same applies for the, the disk tips as well. I, I didn't uh, put the graphs in there. So that actually brings us to the end of the demo for today. We saw the, the five tips, six tips, if you include the timescale tip about how to improve your ingest performance. I just want to give a, um, a quick overview of uh, what we did and give you some next steps. I see one of the questions about the Slack channel name. I'm going to be covering that in just a second. So, so just look out for that. Um, okay, so a summary of what we saw today, we looked at first and foremost, five tips for improving Postgres, Postgres performance. We talked about uh, batching and we talked about uh, things like parallel inserts. So those are the two things you should try first off. And then we talked about some disk optimizations that you can make, things like using more performant disks. We saw the IOPing um, uh, tool in order to check your disk speed. And uh, we talked about how you can separate your write ahead log and your data disks as well. And then we looked at uh, for tip number five, time scale DB. And um, we saw when and why you might want to use time scale and how, uh, as an additional tip, how you can write data in loose time order to get uh, more performance out of time scale DB. So that's what we did today. Uh, for more, if you want more tips and if you want more information, you can check out that blog post that I mentioned in the beginning, 13 tips to improve Postgres inside performance. Uh, that's at tsdb.co forward slash more dash tips. Uh, it'll, this, this will all be in the, in the follow-up email that we'll send you. Uh, for the tool that I used to put together the data set, the sample data set that I was demoing and, and showed you um, that I, I made the graphs from, uh, you can check out the TSBS time series benchmarking suite. The GitHub link is gonna be here. And then if you would like to join the Timescale uh, developer Slack and our Timescale Slack community, you can do so at tsdb.co forward slash Timescale Slack. So that's to answer the question from uh, Anonymous who answered that uh, question. And um, we'd be more than happy to help you configure Timescale to meet your performance requirements in terms of ingest. And so, you know, you can join the Slack community. You can find me there. You can find Timescale co-founders there. It's amazing that, you know, you get to interact with uh, folks like that, as well as Timescale engineers who, who will be uh, more than happy to help you uh, configure Timescale and, and chat about your specific use case. And then lastly, you know, if you're ready to get started with Timescale and you want the easiest way to use it, you can start a free Timescale cloud trial, which is a hosted and managed version, and you'll get $300 in credits to get started. Okay, so that's the stuff that you can do to explore what's next in addition to all the resources that I was linking throughout the, the presentation. Uh, before we get into the questions, just wanted to let you know that you know we, did, we put a lot of time into these sessions. We always wanna make them better. So please, uh, you'll receive a link in the follow-up email to share your feedback and ideas. Uh, you can also just type it into the chat right now if you, if you have things that you want us to cover in future sessions or improvements that we can make. Uh, but do go to uh, this link, tsdv.co forward slash webinar dash feedback, and just leave us your, uh, you know, one minute of, of feedback of, of how we can improve this. And you're also the first to know that we're going to be running another one of these technical sessions on five powerful Postgres functions for monitoring and analytics. Uh, they'll be run at the date over here, and you'll receive an RSVP link in the follow-up email that we send you. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone who's on, uh, asked your questions. It, it please uh, input some more questions uh, uh, and we're gonna be answering them uh, right now. So that's it uh, from me for now. 
let's get into your questions. Please use uh, the Q&A function to put them in.